This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can pull up your Home Life cameras on your TV with your Contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home. This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. You may recall our episode from late January in which I adopted an exaggerated satirical stance responding to a podcaster who had taken exception to my answer to a question on Twitter. The question from my fellow Marketing Podcast Network creator, Seth Goldstein, was whether or not podcasting was a modern form of busking or a street performer playing for change. I said no, and Tanner Campbell, a podcast consultant who has his own show called Podcasting Sucks, disagreed and fired off an episode about me. And I responded with my tongue-in-cheek finger-wagging. You can check that episode out at a link in the show notes for this episode, of course. In that back and forth, though, Tanner and I got to know each other a bit more and discovered we were kindred spirits in a lot of ways. So we thought a more friendly fire discussion about podcasting was in order. What evolved in our conversation was really interesting and fun. The first half of the conversation turned out to be Tanner asking me a bunch of questions. When I realized he was taking over my show, I I flipped the conversation and got to know him a bit more. We talked about the history and recent explosion of podcasts, how both of us got started in podcasting, our opinion of repurposing video content as audio podcasts, and so on, and so on, and so on. We also spent a lot of time talking about the ability to grow and monetize podcasts in this era of mainstream media companies dominating the landscape. Super useful conversation. There's even some good nuggets in there on my history as a radio DJ I think you'll enjoy. Honestly, we could have kept talking for hours, but we'll leave the marathon podcast to the wingnuts of the world out there. Today's episode is probably the first of more to come as we just sat and picked each other's brains a bit. What resulted was what I think is a pretty damn useful listen for those of you interested in podcasts to build your influence as an influencer or as a brand. We talk specifically about both of those scenarios. Before we listen to that, let's talk a little more about listening. We heard the last few episodes from Pete Kennedy, the founder and president at Tagger, the complete influencer marketing software that happens to be the presenting sponsor of this show. Tagger has a new feature out called Signals. It's a form of social listening but very specific to influencers and influencer topics. Pete explained to us last time about how Signals isn't social listening, as most people understand it, but very contextual to influencers. And that is what makes it strong. You know, it doesn't promise that it's it's a, a whole new product and a, a whole, you know, second series of things that you're going to be able to do with Tagger. It's we've added listening within the relevant context of what we do which makes the influencer marketing software as a whole much stronger, I think. No, that's exactly right. I mean, it's it's so interesting. There's so many nuances with influencer marketing. Certain categories work for your industries, right? Um, Certain topics are important. Uh, Competitor strategies in market, you need to understand what those are in a really concise way so that you can conquest your competitors or at least use their best proven strategies in order to implement those strategies within your your influencer marketing strategies. So... Uh, that's really what Signals is all about, a strategy tool, and it, it gives the power of all marketers to become strategists, whereas they might pay a group or an agency a ton of money in order to create that strategy. Signals will do that for you automatically. Outstanding. Thanks to Pete and to Tagger for the great product and for helping bring this podcast to you each week. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, even if it's just to check out the new Signals feature, just visit jason.online slash tagger today. That's jason.online slash tagger. Tanner Campbell's podcast is called Podcasting Sucks. My conversation with him is a path to help you help us make it better, I think. My conversation with Tanner is next on Winfluence.
You're listening to this podcast advertisement, so you know they're effective, but knowing which podcasts align with your target audience is impossible, right? Not anymore. Pod Chaser Pro is the one-stop shop for all podcast data, like listener counts, demographic and geographic information, and contacts for thousands of the top podcasts across any topic or industry. Learn more at podchaserpro.com slash MPN today. That's podchaserpro.com slash MPN. Well, Tanner, this is a first. I've never had the opportunity to interview someone on the podcast who I sarcastically wagged a finger at just a few weeks before. (laughs) So you're in rare air here. Well, I think it's important to point out first and foremost that there's no beef, right? That was all that was all friendly jest. So oh, yeah. that's how everybody took it. Yeah, I hope so too. I, th- I think they did. I didn't get any flack from anybody saying you were really mean to that guy. So, uh, which sometimes I do get. So that could just good. be because they felt I deserved it. <laughs> Maybe who knows? For for the audience's catch up, Tanner was the the podcaster who objected to my answer to the question of whether or not podcasting was a modern form of busking or being a street musician collecting tips. I say it's not. He objected and fired off an episode of his great show, Podcasting Sucks, about me. So uh, back on January 31st, I think, the episode of Winfluence, I had a little fun snapping back at him. So, Tanner, out of curiosity, did uh, did my points make any headway in challenging your own opinion of that question? Oh, yeah, I think it definitely did. I think that we come from, and this is part of what we're going to talk about in this interview, I hope, in this discussion anyway, you and I come from a different beginning of podcasting. You started, I want to say, pretty closely to when I started a little earlier, but you came at it from the beginning from a business marketing standpoint, whereas Mm -hmm. I came at it from a creator artist standpoint. And so I think that our experiences at the outset and for the duration that we've really been in it have been on two different tracks. And so we both had two different opinions. And yeah, I think that you definitely educated me in some things that I didn't know were the case way back then. Well, I, I'm, I'm thank you for saying that. And you're right. We do come at it from two different perspectives. I actually didn't start podcasting per se. I did. I had a short lived uh, show called 100 Proof that I did for about a year, year and a half in 2000. I want to say 13, maybe. And I did that specifically to prove to myself that I could do it, that I could, you know, have a weekly podcast, that I could do a schedule, that I could interview guests. And I really, it was just a test. It wasn't really anything that was going to last. Um, and then I got really busy with client projects and it kind of fell by the wayside. And, um, um, but to inform that point in time, prior to that, I had, rejected podcasts as a medium because I'm an old radio producer. My first Mm. job out of college was a network radio producer. So I produced talk shows and news shows that were really high quality. And back in the mid 2000s to late 2000s, I I mean, I could count on one hand how many podcasts I thought were well done. The rest of them just sucked from my perspective. Now, again, my perspective being a professional audio producer at one point in my career, Um, And so I stayed away from them until the technology got to the point to where it was a lot easier to make them sound good. And enough creators like you came along that actually produced podcasts I wanted to listen to. Then I got interested in it again. From there you became? From there, you know, well, and and you got to remember too, in the 2005, 2006 is when I started working with clients on social media. And so podcasts were part of that array. And, um, And so I was listening to a lot of podcasts. I was advising clients on podcasts, things like that. And then I tested that thing out in 2013 for a year or so. And then when my, um, uh, the, the impetus for me podcasting now was actually the advent of Facebook live. And so when Facebook live opened up and I had access to it, um, I had a doctor's appointment on Tuesday mornings, a chiropractor. But it was I was always there first and I would get done and I would get into the office an hour before anybody showed up. So I would just throw on Facebook Live and start talking to people. After about a month, I realized, holy, there's 40 or 50 people listening. This is a show. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of how it started. I did that for probably, I don't know, six months or so. And then I was like, why don't I pull the audio off and make this a podcast? 
And then I did. And then that kind of evolved into, wait a minute, I should be doing this for Cornette. Let's make Cornette a podcast. And then at the same time, I was you know, thinking about writing Winfluence, the book. And so I thought, oh, wait, what I'll do is I'll split the podcast. And Cornette will have one called Digging Deeper. And then I'll have one to support my, my book called Winfluence. And that's kind of how that evolved. And so now I'm, you know, I've been hosting Digging Deeper for a year and a half. I've been hosting Winfluence back to its original Facebook live iteration for probably three years, something like that. And so, yeah, so I'm relatively new to the podcast game, even though I've been around it and knowledgeable of it for a long time. And I think that's good because one of the things that we indie podcasters, and I just, when I say indie, what I, what I mean is generally the people with no budget in their parents' basement, you know, <laughs> trying to make it work, that kind of scenario. But I guess I would also include any podcaster that's a little bit more professional, just doesn't have big money backing, doesn't have a studio backing. So, so that counts as independent as well. And we really have no sense of marketing. <laughs> it's one of our biggest weaknesses. And we need people like you who understand podcasting from a marketing centric position because there aren't a lot of us who do. And that's that's pretty unfortunate for us in, in a in an environment that's so loud and noisy with, you know, I think the latest numbers are two point three million podcasts in the Apple Podcast Store, four point three million according to podcastindex.org that are available, even though they're not well circulated. And that's a, you know, that's a lot to compete with. One of the things that you just mentioned while you were talking is that when you first started the Facebook Live was that you would repurpose that audio. Now, are you still a fan of repurposing audio? Because this might be another fight. <laughs> that I, I am. And I do that with Digging Deeper. Digging Deeper is a weekly live stream uh, video show for, for Cornette. And I pull the audio off and post that as a podcast. Now, I am, again, you know, professional broadcast savvy enough to treat the video show as if it is going to be repurposed as audio. I understand. And, and I'm, I'm trying to coach, you know, some of the podcasters I work with on uh, the marketing podcast network. Um, Joe Jaffe is one who does a daily interview show, live stream show, and he's all in on video. And I basically, and he, he pulls the audio off and repurposes it, but I've tried to say, okay, we're going to move that over to the marketing podcast network, which we did. But I'm like, Hey, Joe, you've got to remember that this is also being used for audio only. So you've got to talk about the audio only portion of it. And you've got to treat the video audience as if they're only listening from time to time so that it makes a smoother transition. Cause if you're just doing video, which a lot of his show is video clips mm -hmm. that you don't understand the context of if you're listening on audio. So explaining that kind of thing, is something that I've told him, you probably need to try to work that in there. Because when I hear those intro videos with your celebrity friends saying that you're not famous, I don't know who's talking if I don't recognize the voice immediately and not everybody will. So I understand the conflicts there, but yes, I do like to repurpose video into audio podcasts as long as you take that into consideration. I would love to get your feel on this. So one of the reasons that I am anti that repurposing of especially video to a video centric medium to an audio centric medium is not so I actually hadn't thought about how important that not being able to pick up on what was going on because there wasn't a visual aid. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because of my background as a sound engineer, as an audio engineer, I'm focusing more on the, okay, the kinds of microphones we use while producing video are out of frame. They're far away. Those don't generally translate to good audio products once we move over to an audio centric medium where you can, where you're wearing headphones instead of listening in the open air and you can hear a lot more of that signal to noise ratio, blah, 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 blah. So that's the, that's the technical reason I don't like um, mm -hmm. repurposing audio uh, or anything from one platform to another. But another reason is that I have always strongly felt, and I would love you to oppose me on this because you have more marketing sense than I do. So I would love to learn here. I think that when you produce content for medium or platform A, let's say platform A, YouTube, and you try to repurpose that content for platform B, Twitter, that you're not creating in the way that platform B wants you to create. And so that content does not do well as repurposed content. I think we see this a lot in audiograms. Audiograms notoriously do not perform well. I don't necessarily disagree with you from a high level, but I can get into some specific nuances where I would disagree with you. What you're saying is really not different than what I've always told people about social media content. You can't take what you post on Facebook and copy and paste it to Twitter and then copy and paste that to Instagram and then copy and paste that to wherever, right? 
that's because to your point, you're not creating for the native environment of that content platform, which is subtly different. It's not inherently different. Like you can copy and paste from Twitter to Facebook and probably get away with it, especially nowadays because Twitter is more conducive to videos and images. So you're kind of posting the same type of thing, but hashtags don't really matter much on Facebook, whereas they do on Twitter. So there's a lot of nuances where that advice is sound on the social media side of things. And I can certainly see where if you are creating video content and you're like Joe Jaffe, as an example, you're really focused on that live video show product and you're bringing in like, for those who don't know, Joe starts his video show out with, he's got either friends in the celebrity world, or maybe he pays for them. I don't know, probably a combination of both, but like he's got one intro where William Shatner sings a song about how Joe Jaffe is not famous. The title of the show is Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Um, and he's playing off of his, like, I guess, industry cred versus fame. And so it's, it's kind of a sarcastic sort of, sort of thing for him. And so if you don't know William Shatner's voice, if you don't, he doesn't say, hi, I'm William Shatner. And I'm here to talk to you about the Joseph Jaffe is not famous podcast. Like it's a video contextually in video. It makes sense. Doesn't translate to audio. Doesn't translate very well at all. And so I totally agree with you at a high level that you've got to be creating for the specific channel in question. However, you can create video content knowing up front this is also going to be repurposed as audio and create something that's contextually relevant. On digging deeper, and I'm sure there's examples of me not doing a good job of it. <laughs> but examples digging, of all of us not doing a good yeah. job at this. But on digging deeper, when I'm playing B-roll video or I'm showing people something, because a lot of times I'll say, let's go over to this website and look at it. I make it a point to say, now, for those of you listening on the podcast, you're going to need to go to the show notes and click on this link so that you can see what we're talking about. So I'm intentional about making sure that it translates. So I agree with you at a high level, but in a very specific level, we can knock heads on that one. Well, let's talk about maybe promoting your podcast on TikTok. I've heard so many people <laughs> have very, very wildly different opinions about this. Where do you stand on it? Do you think that it depends on the podcast? Do you think TikTok's a great place to promote a podcast? Well, uh, well, I will preempt the answer by saying I've never tried on TikTok. Um, I'm, I'm not... I'm not a great TikToker. I've I've tried to play with it. I understand how it works. I get it, but it's just not a preferred platform for me. Instagram never really was either. And I'm not a big fan of promoting my podcast on Instagram. I don't necessarily find it to work all that effectively, um, at least in my experience, but I've seen other people do it. I think though that it depends on if you are, if you have an audience on TikTok or Instagram or anywhere else, and you can find a way to take that audio content and repurpose it in a manner via video, obviously on Instagram or on uh, TikTok in a way that is compelling for people to watch and or listen to. Absolutely. It's another place that you can say, Hey, I've got this new podcast episode. Here's a little 10 second clip of what, you know, the highlights of this week. I, th I could see how that could compel people to, well, let's click over and listen to that episode. So I don't think it's a bad thing to do. Um, it's just not for me, but I'm also not a short form, you know, content guy. I don't, I don't create 15 second videos with graphics and stickers and emojis and shit all over them. That's just, I'm, I'm too old for that shit. <laughs> What's your go-to then for promoting your podcast for, for pr promoting this one as an example? LinkedIn. Uh, and, and I use LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn and Twitter, but LinkedIn is my primary place because that's where business people go to do business. And as much as I, you know, work with, uh, brands that are consumer facing for both Cornette, the agency where I work and for, you know, my services as maybe an industry speaker or consultant, I sell to businesses. Like I don't sell to consumers. And so Facebook, not, you know, a primary place for me, although I do have a Facebook page and I promote things there. Um, you know, I'm not a big TikToker. I'm not a big Instagrammer, although I will use Instagram from time to time just because there's people there. I've got some followers. It's relevant. Uh, but LinkedIn is, is my go-to because that's where business people are looking for business content. And that's what I produce. Hmm. It's good to know where you're supposed to be, where you're most beneficial. Yeah. You don't have well, to be everywhere to find success. And for the Marketing Podcast Network, which is you know a little bit bigger, it's a, a network, obviously, of podcasts all about marketing. We have a Twitter profile and a LinkedIn page. 
And I have not, nor will I probably start a page on Facebook or any other channel for it because we're not talking to, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're talking to either people who are professional marketers or businesses that want to market to professional marketers. And they're just, I'm not going to, I'm going to have a much easier find time, uh, f- time finding them on a LinkedIn or a Twitter versus other social networks. How do you feel about what's going on with the shift from, and we went back and forth about this a little bit in a conversation that happened between our, you know, our kind of Twitter call out, Twitter battle, <laughs> and this conversation. We talked about how when podcasting first started, the largest percentage of that community was indie creators. Then there were business creators there, but that segment of business creators has gotten larger and larger and larger over time. And that there's been a lot of money that's come into the space that's made it kind of hard for independents who are not, you know, business or marketing savvy or businesses on their own or creators who don't have that big financial backing to be able to get heard, get found, get discovered. Do you have any general thoughts on that overall? I mean, where do you think this place, where this, where, where's this train going? Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's, that's kind of the perplexing problem for an independent creator these days is podcasting has become overrun just like everything else. Um, you know, the big social media accounts, the big blogs and whatnot are, are now owned by big media companies who mm. put a lot of advertising dollars behind hoarding that traffic because they're selling that, you know, visuals to uh, advertisers to advertise there and they need those impressions and whatnot to, to be able to make money. So it's becoming harder and harder to break through, but the independent creator in all of those other channels does break through when they have really compelling content. If you've got a talented creator out there, whether it's a podcaster or a short form video person on TikTok or an artist on Instagram or you know anything like that, they're going to break through the clutter. They're going to build an audience. If they happen to also have some marketing sense and savvy about them, they can break through faster. Um, but the talent is typically the, the signals typically going to rise from the noise. Um, and so I think you came to podcasting in, I think 2010, I think it was. Yep, 2010. And, and, and that was actually after podcasting's first big wave podcast listening in the United States doubled from 2006 to 2009, which was a very short amount of time, but then it leveled off until about 2012. Then it actually declined one year. I remember the, the podcast listenership went from like, I want to say 29% to 24% one year. Mm -hmm. And then it popped back up to like 30 the next year. Um, But then it started gradually ticking up. And um, so it doubled from 2006 to 2009. It took 11 more years for it to double again. So it was this like slow, gradual build. And the last five years, it has become a mainstream channel to engage consumers. And once it crossed that threshold, Then you started to see big media companies investing. iHeartRadio stopped being a terrestrial radio conglomerate and started having a huge investment in podcasts. Sirius Satellite did the same kind of thing. NPR was really the first to kind of come out and say, we're just going to post our content on the Internet and let people download it. Um, Once it's crossed that threshold into the mainstream, the eyeballs, uh, that meant the eyeballs were there and that meant the advertisers were going to go there, too. So now it becomes a mainstream media channel and to break through, it becomes more difficult. The good thing is, is that social media democratized all of this. So for relatively no money, anybody can open up their phone, record an MP3 file, upload it to a service and have a podcast. The people who can create content that's interesting enough that someone will listen to it and say, hey, you got to hear this are going to succeed. If they also then know, we well, you know what, I should post a link to this on my social channels and I should promote it to this group over here and I should get these people to talk about it because I know they'll be interested in it. Those people are the ones that are going to get there faster, but the good content will typically rise to the top. So I guess my last question, and then it seems like I have turned this into a. I was going to say this is my you. podcast. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 my 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 last question, I guess, is. I am very bullish on things like Facebook ads or Google ads. I'm very bullish on paid social, not in the shady ways of paying for followers. That stuff obviously is no help to anyone ever. How do you feel about independent podcasters thinking about coming into the space with a budget in mind? And and what might you suggest in an ideal world? Well, not an ideal world, but in a 
in a minimally ideal world, what would you hope a podcaster could come into the space budgeted with the expectation of spending that on advertising? I think the paid spend, being able to put some money behind promoting your podcast is the difference between a podcast being successful in the first year and not. Mm -hmm. Um, If you come to the table, you've got a new idea, you've got a new podcast, you can put it out there. And if your content is really super compelling and you can organically promote it on your social networks and whatnot, you're going to incrementally grow a little bit. But if you are smart and say, you know what, I'm going to take $25 $25 a month or $50 a month or however much you can afford. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. And you can go to either Twitter or Facebook or even Instagram or maybe even LinkedIn, depending upon what your topic is and where those audiences are and say, you know what? Every time I post an episode, I'm going to put $25 uh, behind it and I'm going to promote it to this target audience that I think the podcast most likely appeals to. And so if you're, let's say you're, uh, you know, podcasting about uh, quilting, you know, you're going to go to probably an Instagram or a Facebook versus a Twitter or a LinkedIn, maybe even Uh, a Pinterest, maybe even a Pinterest. That's true. That's a good one. Um, And you're going to say, I want to target this post that promotes my quilting podcast episode uh, for the next two weeks for $25 to, you know, let's say, and I'm, I'm stereotyping here, of course, but you know, women age 35 and up who like quilting, who follow the quilting hashtag, et cetera, et cetera. That means you're going to get your podcast content in front of a highly relevant audience a lot faster and a lot more frequently than you would otherwise. And that means you're going to grow faster. So the paid spend in social media advertising actually is incredibly efficient, Mm -hmm. incredibly cheap. You literally can start with $10 on some of these platforms. Um, and you can set it to where I, I have $10, but I'm, I'm okay if you spend 50 of my dollars, but don't spend any more than 50. So you can have a tight budget and do this really well. It's the difference between having, after one year, having a couple of dozen followers and a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand followers. Completely agreed. I, I think the spend in the first year is what prevents people from burning out because over the course of two years and three years, that organic is going to build. You're going to get that body of work and you're going to get the benefit of that. But in that first year where you're hustling and grinding and working mm-hmm. your butt off, those that's when people quit is because they feel like they're making no progress. So I've always said that the paid social aspect, you should carry it on every year forever. But in the first year, especially, it's the thing that really makes you feel like you're making any headway. Well, and and that's actually part of the impetus for uh, me starting the Marketing Podcast Network, which launched in November of last year. And the reason that I started that was because I wanted to give those, you know, new creators, those niche creators, specifically in the marketing, you know, field, of course, it's somewhat limited from a guardrails perspective. But I wanted to give those new creators out there a motivation, some sort of acknowledgement and validation to keep going. Because I think too many podcasts, they'll, podcasters will come out and they'll do five episodes and then they'll think, well, I'm only getting a dozen downloads a month and, and six of those are my family members. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and they give up. And, and that disappoints me because I feel like you can't really get good until you've done six, 12, nine months of this stuff. You know, you got to figure it out first. Um, and so the Marketing Podcast Network, the original idea was, I want to find those niche shows that don't have a lot of downloads and that don't have enough downloads to ever make a network podcast CPM model work. They don't have enough M's, right? Um, I want to give them some sort of validation and motivation to keep going. And so the Marketing Podcast Network is set up to, it is uh, basically egalitarian approach. Every podcaster on the network that opts into the uh, revenue share advertising model, you don't have to, but if you want to do ads on your shows, Um, everybody gets the same amount of money every month. We split the pot evenly. And if you have 100,000 downloads that month, you get the same as the the podcast with 100 downloads that month. And the reason we do that is because we want to give those new, you know, young niche podcasts that don't have a lot of audience, we want to give them that validation to keep going. And I've talked enough of the successful podcasters in terms of volume of downloads into sharing the difference between what they make with us and what they could make on their own to basically reinvest in the marketing podcast community. And that's kind of the model there. And I did it specifically for that reason, because I I want podcasters to create, not give up. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Jason. I'm going to turn this show, which is yours, back over to you. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I got questions for you, man. We're 20 minutes in and haven't even uh, haven't even gotten to yours part yet. So, but I, I thank you for the, for the, the back and forth and the questions uh, about these topics. Well, I want, I want the audience that, that I bring to listen to this, to know that you are a, you're a resource, you're an asset, you're a, you are an ally, in, well, in I, I, especially that last bit you just said, it's really important to us. Well, good. I appreciate that. And, and I feel the same way about you, which is why we're doing this. So let me get into you now. So I talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the evolution the, the U.S. podcast listenership doubled from 2006 to 2009, leveled off a little bit, and then declined a bit for, before picking up in the last five years. So you came to the, you know, sort of the uh, the industry about the time the first swell leveled off. So you've been through this climb. You've lived through most of that growth. Tell us how you saw podcasting when you started versus how you see it now. What are the differences? Well, when I very first started, I saw it as I never viewed myself as an artistic or creative person, you know, in, in the ways that were traditionally thought of as artistic, painting, mm-hmm. drawing, sketching. Uh, those things weren't my thing. Words were my thing, but I wasn't a writer at that age. And when I, I also had a career in IT. So when podcasting came about at that time, it was still you had to make your RSS feed which means you had to know what an XML document was. (laughs) And so this thing was nerdy enough that I could get involved in it. And it was based completely around talking. I'm not the, I'm not the most handsome guy in the room. (laughs) So I've got the face for radio, I think is what people say, but I am, I think I can be kind of eloquent. I think I do like to hear the sound of my own voice. I have that amount of ego. (laughs) So I think I'm good for that sort of thing. And so I thought, Oh, well, here's a medium where maybe I could find out that I am actually creative. Uh, and that is exactly what happened. And in 2013, 2012, 2013, I started a podcast in the theology and atheism space. It was a debate podcast, discussion podcast, very friendly. Mm-hmm. And it got 100,000 listeners. Wow. Now, of course, this was back in the Webalizer stat days, so it definitely <laughs> didn't have that many listeners. But to young Tanner podcasting in 2012, 2013, sure. it sure felt like a big accomplishment. But it did have many thousands of listeners, which was still quite a big accomplishment then. Ricky Gervais picked it up. It was it was it was making the rounds. Nice. And I remember then if you had good content, which I felt like I did, if you could get the right guests, if you could take care in the production and the sound quality, you could stand out huge. Because like you said, most of the podcasts then, <laughs> they were pretty terrible, <laughs> yeah, which were. was because most people, you know, they went and they bought a, they bought their Blue Yeti or they bought whatever. USB microphones were not very well developed as an industry then. There, there weren't a lot of options. I think you had like a couple task cam options. I think Blue Yeti, which I think is what you're using a Nano right now, right? Mm-hmm. I want to yeah. say that that was the first real big, uh, real big creators podcast mic to come to the space, as I remember it. So it was easy to stand out. And then over the years, as I released more and more podcasts and felt as though I was getting better and better and better, it became harder and harder and harder <laughs> to grow any kind of substantial audience. I remember this one podcast I had in 2015, 16, 17. It was called Legends, Mist and Whiskey, one that you no doubt would have Ooh, loved. Yeah, I would have loved that. And we had, at that time, stats were way better. So we had like nine to 12,000 downloads per episode within the first 15 or so days. Really popular show. Nice. But I couldn't grow it past that. And, you know, it was really hard with it was monetizing it. And do you remember when podcast monetization solutions first, you know, made the scene, let's say, Patreon in 2013-ish, it feels like, that the podcast listener base was like, how dare you ask yeah. for money? <laughs> You're a monster. You're supposed to be working for us for free. Sure. So s- some things that I've seen that have changed a lot are that mentality doesn't exist anymore. Well, not anymore, but not as much. It's harder to grow, which is why I enjoy talking to people like you who are super smart about marketing and help, help me and the people who listen to me out a lot. And also the way that ads are perceived now by listeners has changed a lot. They don't mind anymore, especially with host read ads and with ones that are even kind of woven in a comical skit kind of way. I love those. You almost never want to skip them as a result. So I think that the industry has matured in a lot of ways. Some of those ways are problematic. The growth aspect to me is the most problematic change. But everything else has been better. It's easier to start. 
all the tools to create, you know, supportive material to promote and think, you know, audiograms, snippets here and there, transcripts, podpage.com is, you know, the pod, podcast website builder. All of these things did not exist in 2010. Uh, so so in, in some ways, this is the best time to enter the space and in other ways, specifically with growth and monetization as a result of that. It's the worst. It's the worst time. Well, I, I definitely don't disagree with you there. And I, and I would to borrow a little bit of experience from the, the book publishing world. Um, you know, if you if you want to write a book these days, they will tell you the only way that you can get a, 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 a publisher to sign you is if you can show them that you've got, you know, 25,000 people on an email list and you've got an open rate of X and you've got a social media following of Y. And to be honest with you, with Winfluence, um, my publisher or my editor and I had trouble pitching the book. Because I had built a really nice social media following primarily on Twitter back in the mid 2000s. But as Instagram and TikTok and other, you know, uh, you know, sort of Gen Z slash, you know, Gen whatever alpha uh, is next, uh, as those consumers entered the marketplace, I didn't really migrate to those platforms. So I still had LinkedIn and Twitter as my primary places. And I didn't do a good job over the years of building an email list. Actually, I did, but I that was with my old blog, which I sold, and I sold the list with the blog, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have it anymore. So I had to recultivate uh, my 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 true audience on my email list, and I didn't have a huge one. So I had trouble selling Winfluence to publishers because I didn't have that built in. I can probably guarantee you five to ten thousand sales right out of the gate because of my network. I think it's the same thing with podcasters now. It's if you can, if you were to come to me as a, an executive producer of a network, which technically I am, although that's not how marketing podcast network works. But if I were to, were to go to Wondery or Audio Chuck or any, you know, uh, Pushkin or any of these other podcast production houses and say, I want to do a podcast, here's my idea. It could be the best idea in the world. But if I can't show them that I can generate 25,000 downloads a month right out of the gate, they're going to say, nope, sorry, we're not going to spend money on you. And that's just the reality of a mainstream media channel world. You just have way too much noise out there. And the signal, um, it, it either has to be incredible content that has a foundation of audience under it already to get funded, or you have to be funded by an, an entity that will say, you know what, we're going to distribute the or promote the content for you. And we have a built in you know, turnkey way of doing that. So if a new podcast goes on Wondery, well, they have 47 other shows with an audience of 150,000 per show that they can promote it to. So if you're an internally created Wondery podcast, you're going to be successful right out of the gate because of the engine they built. If you're an independent person trying to break into Wondery, you got to show them you can bring the heavy with you, which is frustrating, but it is the world we live in. Yeah, it's like we need an incubator. I'd love to see more podcast incubators. Yeah, well, and and maybe that's what the marketing podcast network becomes. That's kind of the impetus of the idea is let's take these little shows and let's you know cross promote and nurture them along until they're a little bit bigger. So maybe I've got a little something on my hands there. So you you talked about you you were an IT guy by trade, right? How did you actually make that jump into I'm going to go record myself on a, a podcast thing? <laughs> uh, well. At first, the interest was just that I could – I'm the kind of guy who likes to take things apart, put them back together, figure out how they work. And so podcasting was interesting to me from that technical standpoint. And I thought, well, I can probably make an RSS document. And I had never done that before. So, you know, there's some trial and error there, frustration, and then you get it. And you're like, oh, okay, I got it. I'm smart now. Uh, but that first um, that first podcast was just my girlfriend and I. She would review YouTube videos, and I would talk about the news. And it was a pod, It would not work today. I can promise you that. <laughs> uh, and it certainly really didn't work then. It was just us having fun. But the way that I made the jump was when I first started, I didn't really feel like I was good at anything. Um, I was good at IT, but I wasn't the best at IT. I was, I was good at writing, but I never felt like I was the best at writing. There was something about podcasting that made me feel like I was the best at it that I knew because I was so early to it. So I was able to develop a little bit of an ego around it maybe, and that helped. And so I made a decision when I started that podcast in 2012, 2013, that theology podcast, I, I made the decision that I've never really had a hobby that I threw everything into. I've never had anything that I've been really exceptionally good at. And at the time, you know, I was in my early 20s, I guess this is going to be that thing. 
And I don't know why I made that decision. I don't know what gave me the arrogance to think that this was going to be the thing I was going to be good at. But I just made the decision. I, I said, I, I don't spend money on any other things. I'm not a woodworker. I'm, I don't work on cars. Like, But I feel like I can be good at this. And I just made the jump. I can't tell you how or why or what gave me the bravery to do it, but I'm glad I did. <laughs> well, we're glad you did too. And I'm sure the clients you work with and whatnot are, are glad you did as well. It reminds me of, you know, I, when I was 14 years old, I marched my little egotistical self into the local radio station and said, I want a job. Um, and it just so happened that my mom knew the general manager. And so it was, there was a little bit of a red carpet laid out for me. It wasn't like, um, I didn't know these people at all, but I marched in and said, I want to be a DJ. And they said, why? And I said, cause all my friends work at the local convenience store, the movie theater, and those are stupid jobs. I want a real job. Oh gosh. And, yeah. And they Ouch. said, and they said, okay, we'll go in the studio here and record this little news you know, script, hit that button to record and read this script and we'll see how you sound. And I went in and did my best fake radio DJ voice and, uh, and they hired me. They said, okay, you can start Friday. We'll teach you how to use the board and, you know, run the reel to reel machines. And, and they taught me how to spin actual vinyl records on actual, you know, uh, platforms and whatnot. So I was a DJ in high school, but what was most fun about that job for me was, which what, what you reminded me of, is while the automation was running, this was in the late eighties. So radio stations at that point were real to real automation. We programmed the computer to play for hours without anybody having to touch it. And so I did the kind of overnight shift. So I didn't really have to do anything except read the weather at the top of the hour. So for the other 55 minutes, I would go back in the production studio and just goof off and just, I want to figure out how to make sounds. I want sound effects and I'm going to play music and I want to make my voice sound weird and I want to do characters. And so I wrote little comedy skits and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and what you just said to me about you finding something, you don't know why you did it, but it was like, I'm going to be really good at this. That was my first entry into this audio world was I'm going to figure out how to be a kick-ass audio production guy. And I did to a degree. But because I was so young, when I was on the air as a DJ, everybody paid attention to me because like this guy's 14 years old and he's on the radio. Oh, my God. Like the one of the TV stations that served my area came to a feature about me at one point. It was ridiculous. Um, so you talk about an ego. Oh, my God. I was obnoxious. It's funny how that helps, though. Right. Like I know I remember so many conversations with my father when I was young, when I was 14, 15, about not wanting to work certain jobs. And he would say what do you think? You're too good to work that job. And mm -hmm. like internally, I would think, well, no, I don't think I'm better than anyone else, but I think I'm better than that job. And <laughs> it, it, there was a real, maybe that's not a nice thing to say. I, I, I don't think know, it's a really but, good way of putting it. I mean, there, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a rub for the people who have that job, but I get that. You know, it's like, I, I have a higher aspiration than to do that. No disrespect to people who do that, but I don't want to do it. And you could be delusional. Right. Well, I, that's I think true. maybe that's that's the that's the cautionary tale is that you could be wrong. And so you shouldn't think that way. Mm -hmm. But I, I and maybe this is how everybody feels. I felt right about it. Mm -hmm. I felt like this is not I'm not going to do that thing over there. I want to do this thing. And there was another aspect of it, too. I don't know if you were popular as a as a kid in high school. I was not. I was chubby. I had didn't have that many friends. I had a couple of close friends, but mostly I got picked on in a lunchroom. I was a fat kid. And you know how that goes in high school. Those I'm people right there with guess. you. We, yeah. we are brothers in arms. And this was a thing where because I wasn't visually present, although I don't think I gave that much thought to that aspect of it, but I could be the popular person making the thing. And that was a draw as well. Bingo. I mean, and, and that's what the being on the air, as it were, in, in radio in high school did for me. It was like, well, Jason is either disappears into the crowd or is average or is below average in everything else. But he does this one thing that nobody else does and nobody else knows how to do. And that kind of made me cool to a degree, not overly cool, but to a degree. At least you felt cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely felt cool. I definitely thought I was way cooler than I really was. But, uh, but yeah, and that kind of fueled me through college. And then, uh, I've got a master's degree and went on to work at the you know network level of broadcasting. So I kind of climbed the ladder and as it were, and then, and then podcasting came around. I was like, God, this sounds like shit compared to what I've been doing. So I'm not going to touch it. And then I left it alone for 15 years and now it's good and I like it again. So there you go. All right. So 
this show uh, is we, we talk about influencer marketing, obviously, in this show. And we've clearly established here a belief that podcasters are influencers. With the growth of the industry of podcasting and the impact of podcasts on consumers, would you advise an Instagrammer or a TikToker to create a podcast? Why or why not? Oh, I totally would. Okay. Especially, and here, the biggest reason why is if you're already an established TikToker or Instagrammer, we were just talking about that mailing list that nobody has when they start. Well, <laughs> you have an already warmed up audience. I mean, if you have 10,000, my understanding is, although this is not true for me, that amassing a significant listenership on TikTok is relatively easy when compared to other platforms. I don't know if that's true, but I have heard that. If your content's good, yeah, I think that's, yes, that's true. And similarly with Instagram, though, certainly not as easy as with TikTok. If you have an entire audience, let's say 10,000, 20,000 people who are already enjoying and consuming your content in location A, think about how you can extrapolate from that existing audience an interest to provide additional forms of your content that dive into that content in a way that isn't short form. If they like you in short form, some of them, it won't be all of them, it will, you know, maybe it's, you know, one to 10% somewhere in there making up numbers, but some percentage of them will want more from you. And so to offer more to them and an expanded version of what they already like, that's a no brainer. I feel like that that's an easy win and you've already got them. They already want to hear about it. Whereas most of us launch podcasts and you know, we, we, we might have a paltry 10 people who signed up for our pre-launch <laughs> list, right? Yeah. So we're like, hey, guess what? Everyone, six of which are family members and the rest of which I barely know. Hi, mom. My podcast is finally launched. Can't wait to have you listen to it. Then only four of them do because most of them signed up out of pity. <laughs> That's so, so yeah, 100%. Absolutely. I think you should. Well, and and I would echo that. And and let, let's use a, a mainstream example. If there are any, you know, Instagrammers, TikTokers, influencers out there listening to this that are like, well, maybe they, maybe you're right. Think about it this way. One of the more popular uh, topical genres of podcasts are comedy podcasts. And I happen to be uh, in my, you know, personal life away from, you know, doing this for a living. I happen to be a student and fan of stand-up comedy. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, however, I hate comedy podcasts. Now I've given you the pre preemptive reason because quality programming is like, I produced a talk show for uh, several years in my first job right out of college. So like, I know how to do this really, really well. And, and I hear stuff that's terrible and I can't listen to it. And most comedy podcasts, think about this. So Tom Segura, I love Tom Segura, big fan of Tom Segura. He's got several million people who watch his uh, Netflix specials. He's got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who come to see him live every year. A fraction of those people will come over and listen to him and uh, uh, his friend, Brett Kreischer, or his wife, uh, Christina P., sit around and just shoot the shit for an hour. I can't stand listening to podcasts that don't have a point that don't have a reason, a goal. You're going to learn this. You're going to hear stories about X. We're going to interview this person and get to know them. They come, most comedy podcasts are two or more comedians just sitting around chatting about anything. And they try to make each other laugh, but there's nothing really planned. So it's not really even all that funny. Now that doesn't mean that Tom Segura is not a successful podcaster because his two bears in a cave podcast and his, uh, Mama's House podcast with his wife. Your Mom's House, yeah. Your Mom's House. Those two podcasts have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of downloads per month. And when you sell advertising on those podcasts, that's probably how he makes most of his money. So if you've got, let's say, 25,000 people on TikTok and you can get 2,500 of them, 10% to come over and listen to your podcast, you're already a bigger podcast from a monthly perspective than 90% of the podcasts out there. And, and if you you're can run ads, you're making something like 60 bucks, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be a whole lot of money until you get into the millions of downloads, but at the same time, it's revenue. It's a platform. And, and to Tanner's point, it allows your fans who really, really like you to get even deeper into your content to the point to where if you did an appearance in their town, they'll pay to come see you. They'll buy tickets, right? So it's a really smart way to do it. So 
Sorry, I'm adding on to your answers, and I probably should just shut up and let you answer. No, that's okay. You're making my answers better. You're doing all the work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, there's the that's the influencer angle. Now there's the company angle, and I know that you know part of your existence is as a consultant for audio products and podcasts and whatnot. So what about a brand that comes to you? They know nothing about the medium, uh, but they've got a bug up their butt about doing a podcast. How do you vet whether or not they're a good candidate for one? And what advice do you give them if they are or aren't? I don't know that I ever vet whether or not they're a good candidate for one. Let me think about that. Maybe I've just never had a business come to me that I was stumped as to how they would be successful with a podcast because I think, I mean, unless you have a very boring business, I, I think there's some kind of a, I look at these, uh, uh, what, what were they called? Venn diagrams? Yeah. Where you take the, the thing that the company makes, mm -hmm. the industry that they're trying to, the market they're trying to serve, and then the third wheel is like interests, you know, things that are not related to either one of those things like camping. Right. And you try to find in the center where all those things overlap. So an example that I give, there's a, I can't remember the name of this company, but it's a company that makes these really rugged, waterproof, all-weather Bluetooth speakers, and, and they are formed in Pelican cases. And I remember... I had a brief discussion with them years ago when I lived in Maine, because if I'm recalling correctly, they're a Maine-based company. And they said, we're thinking about starting a podcast, but we're not really too sure about it. And, and they said, I don't think I'd want to start a podcast about Bluetooth speakers. And I'm like, well, no, of course you wouldn't, because who in the hell would listen to that? But what you might want to start is a podcast about the outdoors. You're having a podcast where you're interviewing great adventurers or people who really love watercraft sports or, you know, pick your, pick your poison. And you become the headline sponsor of that podcast so that your podcast is serving the community which your product directly relates to in a way that doesn't feel like a commercial, but you're also inserting your product to that already pre-qualified audience. This is why I love podcasts so much from a business perspective is that they are, they're self-selecting. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to listen to your podcast unless they like it, which means they're, they're a pre-qualified audience. It's amazing from a business standpoint. Now, that's generally how I determine what they should make is that Venn diagram example. As far as whether or not I think they'd be a good fit, I've done, I don't know if I've ever run into a company that's not a good fit. Well, and, and I don't know that I have either, uh, but I wanted to toss it out there to see if you had. Because, again, like you said, there's always a third uh, category in that Venn diagram. There's always something that overlaps the product and the industry that can uh, interest the people who are potentially interested in one but a part of the other. I've got one. All right. The IRS could not have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to, I would object to that. I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> Janet Yellen could have a podcast. <laughs> because I think if the IRS really, I mean, if they wanted to kind of. No, I know where you're going. You're you right. Know, you're impress right. Everybody the would tune world. In. Everybody would tune in. You know, they would say, okay, here's, you know, either tax tips. I, if it's coming straight from the IRS, IRS people are going to listen to that. But even if they went like a step further and said, Hey, we're the IRS and we're going to start to be a lot more transparent about how we do things and where your money goes and whatnot. And they we're just going to tell you what the hell schedule B is. Exactly. <laughs> and, and dumbed it down for people. I bet there'd be a ton of people that would listen to that. So I mean, it's we, not scintillating necessarily, but it's useful. What we've just proven is that if the IRS could have a podcast, yeah. then you can. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I always use the example of, and this is really ironic because one of my first bosses in radio also owned one of the local funeral homes. Um, and he was a very strange man indeed, but you know, a funeral parlor, you know, a, a mortuary service, that podcast, it's possible. It's a stretch, but it's possible that people would listen to that depending upon who you were. It's funny that you bring that up because a client that I worked with in Maine did exactly that. His job, he worked at a funeral home and his job, he was the guy, not to make this episode morbid, so I'll make this quick, but he was the person who would go and retrieve the body from the place where it passed and bring it to. And he had a podcast that was all about bringing you into that world, understanding what goes into, you know, retrieving the loved one, bringing, and it was a fascinating podcast. I, you know, there's a lot of people out there. There's a, there's a, I actually read a book. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Uh, it's a fairly popular book about basically corpses and how, you know, they're dealt with from a bunch of different angles, the, the mortuary angle, the coroner angle, the police angle, et cetera, things like that. Um, I can't remember the name of the book off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a, I'll put the link in the show notes because it's a 
It's a good resource. It's a good read, but it's weird. But there's a whole world of people out there that like weird stuff. And so I'm sure people would listen to that podcast. for sure. Right. As a business or as an interest, right? You don't need that many people. No. There are 7 billion people on earth plus more now. Yeah. I can promise you there are a million who would care to listen to your podcast if you could get it in front of them. Well, and let me tell you this from an agency perspective. Um, if you're working at a marketing agency or if you're in any sort of professional service, you're a law firm or you're an accountant or whatnot, you don't do a podcast to build a big audience. You do a podcast to invite prospective customers on as guests. That's your lead generation. That's how that works. So there you go. <laughs> Podcasting Sucks is the show. Tanner, where else can people find you on the interwebs? Probably the best place is Twitter at Tanner Helps. Whatever your social platform of uh, preference is, my username is always at Tanner Helps, so it's very easy to find me. You can check my website out at TannerHelps.com. You can find my podcast at PodcastingSucks.com. I have two other podcasts if these flavors of podcasts are interesting to anyone. I have a Stoicism podcast, which you can find at StoicismPod.com. And I have a Mythology and Folklore podcast, which you can find at RetoldThePodcast.com. So I'm everywhere. Excellent. Tanner, thanks, man, for not only for being a good sport on the whole busking thing, but certainly for continuing the conversation here and elsewhere and being a great resource for folks. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter, or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. I've been asked to put together a promo for my podcast, Fuel, the new business show, and I'm the host of Smith, called Keith. With the Marketing Podcast Network, you're guaranteed to hear wonderful marketing-related shows every time like this one and like mine. So if you're interested in finding out how experts in the creative sector generate business for their companies, then give the Fuel podcast a listen. It's packed full of hints, tips, tricks, and anecdotes from the best at winning new business around the world. So come and join the Mad Men. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketing.